right, hello wine drinking people. Time for more of what I've had to drink yesterday. And you know, I'm always happy to see our friends from the Piemonte, my favorite area in the world for wine and the Nebbiolo grape variety to me is Mecca. That is the greatest grape there is. It has that lovely spice and nuance of Pinot Noir, and it has the tannic backbone and the ageability of Great Bordeaux and Cabernet Sauvignon. So for me, there's nothing greater. And the thing that makes Nebbiolo unique, it's only found in the Piedmont. You can't find it all over the world. They thought Pinot Noir was a finicky grape. Well, show me somewhere else in the world where they make Nebbiolo that even comes close to the entry-level wines of the Piedmont. All right, I've had a Mexican wine from Nebbiolo. It was okay, and there's a few in California, but nothing close to these great crews. Sorry, let me redefine that. Anyways, I have someone sending me an email about this tomorrow or tweeting us or whatever. Anyways, we had started out with one of the most unique wines in the Piemonte, a Lange Bianco, as it's labeled, but it does say on the back label it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc. There's not a lot of people that do Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Gaia does one, La Spinetta does one, and uh, Marquise de Gracie does one, but the difference is theirs is no oak. So you really get the true essence of the Sauvignon Blanc varietal. In this wine, 2009 vintage, is this the current release? I mean, Sauvignon Blanc is highly resistant to oxidization, but it's a little bit old for Sauvignon Blancs for some people. But this wine had beautiful fruit still, melon, fig, kind of pink grapefruit, some nice sweet herbs on the nose. You get a little earthiness to this wine. And on the second day, Wow, it had like a Reggiano Parmesan cheese note coming out to it. I've never smelled anything quite like it in a Sauvignon Blanc before. Very exotic, man. Really rich and creamy on the tongue with bright citrus fruit, that melon, tongue tingly acidity, and a long layered finish, man. The essence of Sauvignon Blanc from the Piedmont. And that salty Parmesan note coming through on the finish on the second day. Really unique stuff. Excellent juice at $25. A great one for brown bag tasting. All right, and then up the Dolcetto. Hey, everybody makes a Dolcetto. Why? Uh, this one was pretty good. And they say this wine supposedly ages well, but it's not my favorite grape varietal. I don't want to taint anybody's opinion about Dolcetto, but for $23, you can get some pretty damn good Barbera. Anyway, so Nebbiolo Lange, which uh, this wine, all southwest exposure to this vineyard. This is a very famous vineyard site in Barbaresco. It goes right between Asili and the Rabaja Cruz, and there's 11 hectares here. And this wine is done all in stainless steel. And the winery started producing wine in 1973. They've been growing grapes and selling them to other people, Protatori and others. And uh, they decided in 73, look, we have some great vineyards here. We're going to start making our own wine. And this is kind of when the revolution happened. I mean really a little bit before a lot of these growers in the Piedmont said, look, why should we sell these grapes to the co-ops? We can put our name on the bottle and make something infinitely better. And uh, thank goodness they did because pro producers like this now exist, the Marchese de Gracie, producing some of the greatest Barbaresco that I've ever tasted. I'm embarrassed to say this is the first time I've had these wines and uh, just incredible, a beautiful bouquet in this wine, red cherry berry fruit, rose petals, notes of red licorice and truffly earthy notes. Really pretty, man. The essence of Nebbiolo here in this wine, that red berry fruit on the tongue, a nice array of spice and floral notes, that truffly earthy character, fine tannins, a beautiful entry-level Nebbiolo at $26. A few dollars more than the Dolcetto. Okay, the uh, Barbaresco Martenenga, which is a trademark name. I've never seen, you don't see trademarks on a lot of wines. Well, Gaia's wines have trademarks on them, but... Um, this is all one single vineyard, as I mentioned, between those famous crews, and these are from the higher elevation parts of the vineyard. The other stuff goes into the Nebbiolo. Depends on the vintage, of course. Um, in good vintages, they can use more of the lower section. This wine has got a beautiful bouquet here also, just a notch up in concentration, that dry rose petal character, the exotic spices, the orange peel, the licorice all coming out in this wine with wonderful richness on the tongue. 2010 is an amazing vintage in the Piedmont. It's incredible how good these wines are drinking because the the press and everybody else are saying these are, you know, 20, 30 year wines, but they're going through this baby fat stage right now where they're actually very showy. And uh, just like any great vintage, they drink like a bell curve, they drink nice, and then they'll shut down. So if you're going to drink or try your 2010s, you want to try them right now before these wines shut down uh, because all great vintages usually do. This wine's got wonderful richness on the tongue, even better on the second day. Seems to gain some weight in the mid palate. Lovely, silky, smooth texture. That spice, the earth leading into a long, zesty finish. This wine needs some time, but has all the right stuff. And $58? Are you kidding me? For a wine you can keep for 30 years? <sighs> 
2008. Thank God most people don't know about these wines because they would be a lot more expensive. The Martinenga Barbaresco Gayun, which this is, uh, like I said, all south exposure. This is right at the edge of the Asili crew. It's on one side of the amphitheater vineyard here and a lot of earth here. A little minty note coming in. A solid core of red cherry fruit, though. This wine does see some new barrique. A little one year and older barrel, so not 100% new. And I should have mentioned these are all from the town of Treso. There's only three villages really in Barbaresco, but thick and juicy red berry fruit on the tongue. An array of that spice, the mint, the firm tannins, a really classic vintage. These 2008s, a little cooler, but uh, this wine also has all the right stuff, needs time. More elasticity, Mr. Marquez, he says, in Barbaresco. So it's more uh, adapted in many different dishes rather than Barolo, which is a little hardier. Uh, the total production here is 100,000 cases, but they only make 700 cases of each of these crew wines. So for $80, wow, uh, incredible stuff. The 2007 Camp Gross, which is their top wine. Well, actually it's not because same price as the other wine. So usually most expensive means their top wine, but it was my favorite wine of the tasting. And this is the vineyard that sits right beneath the Rabaja crew. And wow, what an incredible bouquet. This 2007 vintage also outstanding, kind of menthol, exotic spices, red berry fruit, rose petals, truffles, incredibly complex, even bigger and more complex on the second day. This wine thick and juicy on the tongue, long layered finish, firm hand of acidity, wow. Delicious right now, but man, this wine will live on for decades in your cellar. Bravo to the Marchese. And, oh, I'm sorry, we can't finish without the Moscato. Moscato di Asti, the soda pop of wines. Your kids are going to love this wine. It's only 5% alcohol. It has such a pretty nose. I, I mean, it's uh, peach, apples, pretty flowers, orange blossoms, and uh, just slightly sweet and uh, very refreshing, great in the, for a daytime drink if you want something lower in alcohol and a uh, really lovely finish on this wine. Great stuff at $20. Moscato is the largest growing white varietal category in this country, but not the Moscato from the Piedmont. This is the Holy Grail. All right, that's what we had to drink with the Marchese de Gracie. I'm your host, Andrew Lampassoni, signing off for the Wine Watch, saying remember, always drink the good stuff first.